Well, Tommy, first things first. Once and for all, I think we need to go ahead and make the announcement that you are, in fact, my dad. <laughs> well, I don't. I, I don't. I don't think so. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times over the years have I been asked how we're related. Listen, that was just a joke. We are not, in fact, related, at least not close enough to borrow money. <laughs> well, well, that's that's true. You know, I think, uh, when did we meet? We met back in the... It was the 90s. early 90s. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking it was early 90s, something like that. And uh, I said, well, where'd he come from? Uh, you know, I didn't... <laughs> all the years was <laughs> over around Hickory, you know, but... Uh, but nevertheless, we're uh, we've been friends. That's good. Now, are you related to Sam Houston? I hadn't checked back that. Far. The governor of Texas. I'm, I'm okay. Sure. All right. Okay. All right. Well, I am. In fact, I am related to Sam Houston. <laughs> so I was thinking that maybe somewhere through the wood pile, somewhere we might we might be distant relatives. Well, it could be. You know, yeah. it, it it very well could be. All right. Well, Tommy, how long had you been racing in the late model sportsman division when it was reformed in 1982 into what we now know as the Xfinity Series? I, I, I started out in 66, I believe it was, okay. 65. And um, I ran a couple of dirt races around Shelby and Antioch Speedway, you know, which is right near where we're at now. And, uh, you know, but... I, I just ran late model stuff from about 1968, 69, along in there. And um, and then when the Bush Series come along, they're 81 or 80, whenever it was. Uh, then we jumped up to the Bush Series. But I, I couldn't tell you how many races that we ran. I know we ran all over the country, you know, everywhere when it's late model sportsmen, you know. But... Uh, I know one year we'd won like point twenty some races, and and we we'd win races practically every year. But we were going to a lot of tracks where you had your local guys, and you'd go up against them, and it wasn't it wasn't as competitive as what it would be, like say now when everybody goes to the same track and you got all the hot dogs in in one deal. And basically, I think that's what the Bush Series or the Budweiser Series when it started out was all about. What was the reasoning behind creating the "quote unquote" new series? Well, I, I, there again, I think uh, pulling—you'd uh, pull people out of Virginia, you'd pull them out of uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida. I mean, it's people come from all over, you know. And um, it—I think what they were trying to do at the time being, when Budweiser decided or Anheuser Busch decided to sponsor this this deal and, and long term deal. They wanted to put together some more quality racing, and in so doing, I think they felt like they could get some of the best from each track around and put okay. them all together. And exactly like what I was talking about, you then you had a you had a group that was uh, pretty tough. Everybody that was that would go to the bush races. So it'd be basically like an all star race every week. Yeah, exactly. Okay, all right. Now, what was your reaction to all that? Were you on board with that? from the beginning or did it take some time to maybe convince I, I, you i didn't i didn't even think about it it's just something else to do and it was it was something that was a little bit a little above the, the quality was a little above the late model uh, racing and we, we were at the time being was trying to step up to get on up to what was uh what was that called then it wasn't winston cup it was uh i think it was it was called the uh, Grand, Grand National. Grand National, yeah. Yeah, Grand National Series. We were trying to get on up into the Grand National Series at that point in time, but uh, uh, anyway, that's how it come about. The first three years of the, the new series, Jack Ingram and, and Sam Ard really kind of separated themselves from the rest of the pack when it, when it came to the championship. What made them so good? Well, they – Sam had – he had awful good equipment. He had money behind him with uh, Thomas Brothers Country Ham. And, uh, of course, Jack, uh, he, he knew he knew the ropes pretty good, and he had run 
on a lot of these little bull rings like New Asheville Speedway and, uh, you know, and then some of the other bigger tracks at Nashville, places like that. And and it, it was just natural that that uh, they come together. They knew what they were doing. And then, of course, we got in some pretty good equipment. I, I say we, I did, at the time being, driving different cars for like Andre Teague and, and, uh, and people like that that had a little money and, and could afford the tires and do stuff like that. But I've got quite a few of those third place trophies from the, <laughs> the early 80s <laughs> behind Sam and Jack. <laughs> How frustrating was it for you to basically be battling for third place as opposed to the actual championship? Well, we, we won some races. Oh, we, yeah. yeah. Every, every year we won a few races, but all in all, probably Jack and Sam was the top. They were cream of the crop, you know. I mean, we would get in there and, and go, and then – there was so many other people like Jimmy Hensley that would come along. Tommy Ellis was in there, and and uh, and LD and people like that all all would would go in there. So you you had a pretty good field of, of cars, a, a pretty good field of drivers. I mean, quality drivers in there. In second to none, uh, you you kind of hinted that Sam's engines were tricked out a little bit. <laughs> Sam had there there again. If you get back to the start of, and take a look at who when rick hendrick started his uh his teams up and everything rick was from let me start over we get up to <laughs> there's there's a guy by the name of clayton mitchell okay right. up in norlina yeah and he was a tractor he had a old farm tractor place up there and he built the cars for ray hendrix well some of these people after Ray and after everything got going, Rick Hendrick started. And if you look at some of the Dortons and uh, and uh, T A Tombs and all the people like that, that's who Sam had working on his stuff at that point in time. <laughs> and of course, Jack had Ben Barnes, and then we finally got hooked up with Ben Barnes. And uh, uh, Ben had uh, uh, Jack, and of course he had uh, Harry Gant, and and of course ourselves, and and. I think Jack originally started with his brother, Tom Ingram. Okay. I think Tom's the one that did it. But getting back to that deal about Sam and him and Rick Hendricks and them, and when Rick started up his cup teams and everything, he had a lot of them people that had worked for Sam come over there, and they was working for him. Okay. So that pretty much tells it right there, <laughs> what he had. But they would come to the racetrack, and they'd have the intakes raised up on the engines. And they, they had a lot of things that a, a, a lot of other people didn't have. But Sam was a heck of a race car driver. You can't take nothing away from him as far as that goes either. All right. 1983, Indianapolis Raceway Park. Tommy Houston and Tommy Ellis, last lap, you – and he make contact coming off turn two for the win. Uh, Tommy Ellis spins. Take it away, Tommy Houston. And and tell me what happened post-race. Uh, Tommy, he come out there, and he was uh, about eight laps from the end of the race. We were racing. I was leading the race. Tommy comes up on the inside of me, and he wasn't, he, he wasn't faster than me by no means. He comes up on the inside of me, and he gets up into my – left rear, and then into my door, and he boots me out of the way up across the racetrack. Okay. All well, right. we, we go back from that point on, and we race it on down to the last lap, and I said, and I was still mad because he had knocked me up off the racetrack, and he was holding me up big time bad off of there. And I said, well, we ain't going to finish like this. And we come off a of two down there, and I just got my bumper against him, and I was pushing him, you know. I mean, if he could have turned it to the right maybe a little bit more, he might have could have saved it, but I doubt it, you know, because I hit him pretty hard and and uh, turned him around, but come on around. And we were out on the racetrack in Victory Circle with Bob Daniels, and somebody come up there and said, Tommy's down in your pits, and he's beating up all your pit equipment. <laughs> he knocked the gauges off the – nitrogen bottles for the air ranches <laughs> it's a wonder it didn't blow him up but, and he was, he was he was running around the pits hollering somebody give me a match give me a match give me a match 
He was going to burn the pits. <laughs> he was going to burn the pits up. With the, with the regulators off the oxygen tank. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was going to create his own space yeah, program yeah, right there. I, under, I understand his point, but he needs to understand my point, too, that uh, when, when he knocked me up across the racetrack with less than 10 laps to go, uh, would if I had done the same thing to him and him been faster than me, would he not have done the same thing back? And I feel certain he would. <laughs> Tommy, the most cup races that you ever ran in a single season was seven with Roger Hamby in 1981. Was there a point where you made a conscious decision to focus solely on what was then the Bush Series, or did the right opportunity in Cup just never come along? It it never. It never come along, okay. you know, and and I think we would have been okay, but that was a different time. I mean, you have different thinking. You can look back and see how things could have, would have been, but it, it didn't happen that way. And uh, Roger's stuff, Roger was uh, he was from over your way. He was over North Wilkesboro, and Roger would always tell me. He said, "Tommy," he said, "I'd tell him. I'd say, Roger, I can't drive the car. It don't the car won't drive straight." And we were at Talladega, and I was coming home. I had made some laps in it, and you absolutely couldn't hold it straight up and down the straightaways. And Elmo Langley come over, and he looked at the car, and he asked Roger, he said, are you trying to kill this boy? And Roger said, what's wrong? Elmo said, you have got front, you've got rear steer spindles on a front steer car. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and the Ackerman on the on the spindles where the tie rods hooked up. Anyway, Elmo got all the equipment, and Donnie Disharoon was working for Roger at the time B, and he changed it. And the car went back out there, and the car ran straight, and I think we wound up uh, 11th or something like that at Talladega. I know they had a couple big wrecks in it, yeah. which we didn't get in, but, uh, you know, but it, it ran pretty good. Now, did he get... Now, didn't he get most of his stuff from Junior, the, the cast-off stuff? Yeah, that's what he would tell me. He said, Tommy, this this car has got to be running good. He said, I bought it from Junior. He said, I bought the mo- I just bought this motor from Junior, and he ran it at such and such a track somewhere that didn't even fit the criteria of yeah, the motor yeah. you needed at yeah. Martinsville, you know. But Roger was he, – he was trying to do his best is what he could do a learning, and I was trying to do the best that I was could do is trying to learn the cup side of it. And uh, I reckon Earnhardt helped me as much as anything because he gave me a uh, he gave me a chassis from down. It was in an old building down in Concord, and it was straight chassis and everything. We built a Monte Carlo up with it, and the car ran. We ran second in one of those West. Deals that yeah. was still a cup deal yeah. at uh, Hickory to Bobby Allison, and um, then um, that that car was a pretty good, pretty good race car. But uh, yeah, but just we just never did get the opportunity to get in something and stay in it, you know, for one whole season, you know, to do it like that. Was there a point where you were comfortable in the Bush Series and you would have stayed, even if a mid-pack cup ride had to come along oh yeah yeah okay yeah yeah it, it was you know it, mm-hmm. it got to the point when the bush and there again when the bush series come along after a few years in it and we got some pretty good sponsorship dollars southern biscuit flour come along uh rosie's stores you know so we had some pretty good backing with us had had a good team under us uh, uh martha and i's my wife and me, our oldest son Scott, he was uh, he was coming along and he was about ready to graduate from high school and he made a pretty good crew chief. Marty, my middle son, he was a heck of a good tire changer. Matter of fact, he still works for RCR right now for the Xfinity team. And uh, of course, Andy, uh, I think everybody knows Marty and Andy both, and of course Scott too. But uh, uh, he he had a good shot in the in the cup, and he ran good. If somebody would have give him a chance to run the whole season, you know. Yeah. The issue of cup drivers racing in the Bush Series has been around since the very beginning. 
I mean, Dale Earnhardt won the first race of what we now know as the Xfinity Series at Daytona in 1982. What was your thinking about racing against the Cup guys? Well, they've they've changed it a whole lot. Matter of fact, they're doing something now that I agree with 100%. And that's – see, when we were doing it with uh, racing against the Cup guys, we would go there and we'd take our car pretty much ready to go, what we needed, and what we could gather information and uh, any kind of setups from any of the Cup people. And that's the way we'd go to racetrack. Well, when – like – if Waltrip got down there, Daryl and Dale and some of them got there, and a lot of the other people that would jump over from the cup side, they were slinging gears. They would come and they'd practice with one gear when he got time to qualify, and they'd be running basically. And what they were doing, they were running race setups then, just like we were. When it come time to qualify, they'd stick a lower gear in it or a higher gear. They'd put bigger springs in the – and they'd change the whole chassis setup and everything like that and go out there and bust off a lap. Sometimes half a lap, I mean a half a second quicker than than what we were. And we're still sitting there just running the same old time that we're running. You know, and by um, evening things up now to where you pull on the starting line, no practice, no nothing, and just go, I think it's a whole lot better. Yeah. I think it's a whole lot better deal. We didn't have that luxury at that time. Of course, we didn't have soft walls, and we didn't have – there was a lot of things that we didn't have. But history. So back then, was there ever a point where you did go to NASCAR and say, hey, is there something that you can do about these guys coming down and racing our big races and taking home a, a pretty large chunk of the purse or – were you okay racing against them? Yeah, I, I never did. I never did complain to NASCAR much about as far as the Cup drivers being in in with that. And a lot of people said, "Well, it makes you a better racer." Uh, you know, if you're racing against people like that. Well, it, the same token was when they come back and they raced on the tracks like I raced on too. You know, I was yeah. I was quite a bit better than a lot of them uh, in the time. All right. Now, all of your wins came on tracks of a half mile or less. Mm -hmm. Is that basically where you felt the most comfortable, or was it a deal where maybe the brakes just didn't fall your way on the bigger tracks? Yeah, I felt comfortable on the short tracks, and that's that's where I started. But uh, I felt comfortable on the on the bigger tracks as well. You know, of course. We did uh, qualify on the pole at Daytona, and I think still hold a record there. Um, and at Dover, we was leading the race with 10 laps to go, and there again I gave Morgan Shepard his lap back or let him go, and he beat me, and I, won, I ran second, <laughs> you know, and that, of course yeah. a mile track. Yeah. Uh, Darlington, we, we ran good at Darlington uh, all the time, but just never did get her in the right – deal I, you know we had good finishes rockingham darlington places like that if you look back we had seconds thirds top fives i mean uh you know we were right there but uh it, it's just that little bit that you need there again you get back to like from the cup side because most of the time that's who won the races was cup drivers all right dill earnhardt eventually wound up marrying your niece when he raced you on the racetrack, were you a family member or were you another race car driver? Oh, Lord, no. We were, we were, <laughs> we, we were competitors uh, uh, pretty heavy. And there again at Raceway Park, it gets back to the deal between Tommy Ellis and myself. Uh, I did Earnhardt. When we come off of four, he was leading the race and I was running second. And I got into his bumper on the left rear, and I jumped out like that to pass him, and I was going to pass him because he was holding me up pretty bad. Now, is this and for it, the win, or? No, this was in the race. This okay. was during the race. The race wasn't half over with, I reckon, you know, maybe halfway. But, uh, you know, I was going for the lead on the thing, and I did, and it, he hit the wall, and when he come off the wall, he knew he had done hit the wall hard enough that it wasn't going to be pretty for him the rest of the race. So he turned his car dead left into me, 
and drove me straight down through there sideways. And I, I can remember, I could hear his motor. You know, it, he was pushing me. He was guiding me like that. He was steering it. And he had me zeroed in on Brett Bodine was in the Thomas Brothers Country Ham car, I believe. Yeah. yeah. And he drove me straight into Brett like that right there. And I think he really had his eyes set on one of them light poles. Right <laughs> that he was going to try to drive me into it. But, but Brett I, just happened to get in the way. Yeah, yeah. So that was a, that was something on my part. But we had some words over that. But uh, we kind of got all that took care of later on. And, you know, we let it go at that. Now, you mentioned Sam and the engine thing. Um, there were also those – on the other hand, who, you know, maybe gave you a little bit of a hard time and said, well, Tommy Houston and Robert Black, they're fishing buddies. They're big, they're big time buddies. So Robert will let Tommy get away with murder. <laughs> what was your response to stuff Robert like that? Robert wouldn't know which end of a fishing pole to hold to, <laughs> <laughs> to catch a fish. <laughs> and Robert and I are still good friends. Yeah. But, um, no, I don't, I can't recall any breaks that he gave maybe he did yeah you know maybe he did because at one point in time we did socialize together and we'd go have a couple drinks together and uh and uh and hang out at home you know but because martha my wife and robert's wife shirley they were they were friends you know and so we would visit and stuff like that but uh no i don't i don't think so i i mean i think uh who was it? I'm trying to think of who who said that. That when we went to Asheville, he said them uh, call them uh, I'll think of it in a little bit, and I'll tell you about it. It was about the line. It was about the line. Presley's Jack might have said it, and them cheating ass Houston. <laughs> 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 but but we we that doesn't sound like Jack at all. We did, <laughs> we didn't try to uh, at the point in time we could uh, we could kind of be innovative on our own is what we needed to do and if it's like trying to take lead out of the car, uh, you know you could have a helmet that weighed about fifty pounds or something <laughs> like that, but you didn't have to wear it. You know you you could have duct tape with the uh, uh, the duct with the tape on the outside of a chunk yeah. of. 40 pound lead and, uh, and uh, there there was a lot of things that you could do but we didn't as far as getting out of line in, in, in the motors and uh, so on like that we never did we never did go places like that you know big motors and stuff like that all right 1986 you mentioned the qualifying lap at daytona that at the time was the fastest bush series qualifying lap ever what did it mean to you to be able to to set that record? And for a guy from Hickory who had banged around Hickory Motor Speedway, who had banged around all the short tracks, to go to Daytona and set a record that I believe still stands. Mm-hmm. So what did it mean to you to be able to do that? Well, that, that was one accomplishment. We were trying at the time being, we was trying to do everything we could because we had uh, a GM behind us. We had Buick. Uh, the Buick brand behind us, and they were helping us quite a bit, and they were feeding us a, a, a lot of really good equipment through Ruggles Engineering out of Atlanta, and, and uh, I think Carl Wagner was doing a lot of the, uh, a lot of the V6 engines, stuff like that. But it meant so much to me because it showed that we could go down there and we could run fast laps. But when the race started, and we're out there, and we're running a 15-degree spoiler. I think we were qualified with like a five-degree spoiler, so it was a straight back. Five degrees. Wow. Yeah, and uh, we, we bumped it up to maybe 20 degrees, something like that. And here comes Earnhardt and Bodine and them. Earnhardt, uh, Bodine was in a Hendrix car, I believe, believe I get car or something, and, and they had them spoilers standing straight up, and maybe pieces added to them and everything. And we weren't no match to them in the race, but it got back to what they had learned back in the cup side of it to get that car just as tight as you could get that thing to start that race and run the whole race like that. You know, it slow you down some, but uh, and because I remember Earnhardt coming down and I was leading the race, and the first thing he done, 
he jumped up behind me, run up real close going into turn one, and backed off and then run up close to me again like that, and he pushed that air up there and lifted my back wheels off the ground. He never hit me. Yeah. The air was doing it because it just lifted the spoiler and hold back the car straight up. Well, I started turning sideways. I mean, here I am. I'm looking at the infield, you know. And he didn't crash me, you know, but he jerked that thing left and boom, he was to the inside <laughs> and him and Bodine about four or five just drove on yeah. by me like that because I was still trying to catch my breath. You know? <laughs> <laughs> 1988 at Darlington, you get you get tangled up with the pace guard uh, on, on pit road at, at Darlington. What happened there? The race was over with, and I, I come down pit road after the race, took my helmet off. I was still strapped in the car. And I talked, I pulled up to my pits, and I talked to Scott and some of the other people in the pits there a little bit. And I took off and went on down pit road. And I was going down pit road, and the wall at Darlington on the, the infield or the pit road wall down through there was higher and I couldn't see across it from the car. Yeah. And I punched it up second gear and was going down through there pretty good, you know. And at about that time I was getting toward the end of pit wall and I just saw this car come right in front of me like that. Oh and, gosh. and the pace car, he was coming down the racetrack and when he did, he turned across because he couldn't see me. You know, I mean, it was just two two blind spots like that. Yeah. And if he had gassed it, I might have could have clipped his back end. But I think he panicked and and just like that, and jumped on the brake, hoping I could miss him or something like that. And I t-boned him. Wow. You know. But uh, fortunately, it didn't hurt any of us. Yeah. But it was. It was and you didn't have belts deal. on. No, I did. I still had my belts okay. on. Okay. All right. Yeah. But I think pace car driver. I don't. I think he was still strapped in too, okay. you know, because I don't think he got any yeah. head injuries out of it. <laughs> I don't know. 